you so much, Lotte. And I'm not entirely sure if there's a presentation that will be loaded up, but hopefully um, a screen might appear at some stage. Uh, let me thank at the outset um, uh, colleagues at, at the Nordic Safe Cities Network and the Strong Cities and ISD, of course. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be addressing this group. Maybe we can turn to the next, the first slide. Um, if we, even before COVID-19, uh, I think it's clear that cities faced a bewildering array of safety and security challenges. And I think we can think of these on a continuum. They range from domestic abuse and intimate partner violence, stuff that happens privately in the home and sometimes on the street, to basic street crime, to public disorder and protest, to gang violence, to social unrest, and all the way out to extremism and even outright political violence. Um, and I think what's important to stress at the outset is that threats today, uh, and increasingly so, are not just physical, but they're also occurring in digital spaces. Um, and this is especially so with the acceleration of digitization. We now have virtual threats, layering physical threats, targeting our digital systems, our infrastructure, our personal accounts, our email addresses, using a whole host, a bewildering range of, of, of malware. Um, but also we're seeing increasing the threats of uh, technology enabled threats, including things like drones and the next generation of biotechnology. So we have a pretty big threat landscape facing cities. Next slide, please. With all of these different security and safety challenges in the real world and in cyberspace, the question really before all of us is what's a city to do? You know, now, some cities have invested heavily in problem-oriented policing and community policing, tracking a whole range of how global threats affect the local realities, um, but really focusing in on communities. Others have invested heavily in massive social prevention programs targeting at-risk groups. Um, some cities are experiencing with, or, you know, experimenting with urban design interventions, looking to design out crime altogether. And they're also seeing this big move, not necessarily in Nordic countries, but, but certainly around the world, of introducing mass surveillance, predictive crime analytics, technology investments, as well as uh, investments in digital literacy. Now, in a world of major financial challenges, big deficits, um, especially in the wake of COVID, prioritization is going to be essential. Next slide, please. The smartest cities, I think we all can agree in this talk, are going to be data-driven and evidence-based. They're going to be investing heavily in these kinds of solutions. But I think they're also going to understand some really basic facts about urban insecurity. And that is that, like so many other phenomena in the world, crime concentrates. With the, some exceptions, it tends to concentrate in space, by region, by country, by city, by neighborhood. It concentrates in time, at certain times of the day, of the week, of the month, of the year. It concentrates among very specific demographic groups by gender and age. It concentrates where risks aggregate, where you have deep concentrations or overlapping cumulative risks like inequality and social disorganization. And it tends to concentrate in relation to the built environment, especially where we have poorly lit or crowded or non-surveilled areas. Next slide, please. These are what some people call the laws of crime concentration. And they apply across many types of crime, not all, but many. Um, from homicide to assault to even cybercrime and even extremism, you tend to see crime and violence concentrating in very specific places. It's sticky in the vernacular. And we see crimes occurring at regular intervals, often at night, on weekends, at very specific hours. And the reality is, is that a very small number of people, this is so obvious, it's painfully obvious, but it needs to be restated, a small number of people are responsible for an inordinately disproportionate amount of crime. Uh, point, in other words, crime is relatively non-random, and this concentration represents an opportunity. It allows city planners and police and public health officials and social services and urban planners uh, to design targeted interventions. So for the remainder of this very short presentation, I want to do three things. I want to quickly describe why crime concentrates. I want to describe how it concentrates, and then I want to give a few quick takeaway messages. Next slide, please. There are at least three... Next slide, please. Um, there are at least three crime theories out there. Uh, that explain why crime concentrates. And just very quickly, it's rational choice, routine activities, and environmental criminology. And they explain, they help explain the sort of law of crime concentration. And the basic idea is that offenders make decisions based on the available information they have online or offline, and whether there's a suitable target, and, and whether there's a capable guardian or not. Those are the three basic ideas. Rational offenders identify opportunities as they go about their daily routines. So the theory predicts that if offenders and victims are prevented from converging in space and time, this can be manipulated by the environment and therefore we can reduce and prevent crime. Next slide, please. 
So how does crime concentrate? Well, there's a rich literature on this, um, and it tends to be concentrated in OECD countries and less so in lower middle income settings, but the patterns tend to be quite common. Geographically, most crime events tend to occur in a very small proportion of neighborhoods and street addresses. In Malmo, for example, there are 18 hotspots, most of them near bars and clubs. That won't surprise anybody on this call. And what we found is that certain kinds of CCTV camera interventions and strategic police deployments between 12 and 6 in the morning uh, actually on weekends reduce crime by about 20 percent. Temporally, a great deal of lethal violence also occurs on the weekends between, not surprisingly, 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., typically around paydays as well. And demographically, crime tends to concentrate amongst, amongst perpetrators, amongst younger, often underemployed men who make up most of the victims and perpetrators. So of course, women and girls and others are victimized in very specific ways. And in cybercrime, the vast majority of victims tend to be older, less digitally savvy, even though there's very specific targeting of high net worth individuals in some cases. Next slide, please. In most countries, a very small number of offenders are disproportionately responsible for an overwhelming amount of the crime. In Denmark, a recent study found that 7.5% of the co-offending population accounted for 50% of crime volume. And if you parse it down even further, they found just 1.2% of all the offender population was, was responsible for 24% of the overall harm. And they call this the power of few. So final slide, please. Let me just conclude with a few quick takeaways here. Um, and the first is that hotspot mapping tools from Comstat systems to predictive analytics, which have come a long way, are game changers in helping police, social workers, and urban planners uh, identify and respond to the places, the times, and the groups, as well as where crime concentrates. Second, social media analytics are also key owing to the, the social network dynamics of violent crime. So there's a need increasingly for monitoring that is highly targeted while also respecting privacy. So we need to be mindful of data protection when it comes to these data aggregating and uh, management systems. But we also need to be wary of the biases that they can reproduce, including the ways in which some of these technologies can lead to over-policing. And I think this is fairly well known. Third, because of their micro determinants effects, hotspot interventions, including focused deterrence, are very effective at addressing crime and disorder reductions. I mean, there's a very strong empirical basis for this. Um, so we should be monitoring and, 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 and organizing our, our, our interventions around, I think, these kinds of strategies. A study by Braga of over 78 hotspot policing programs around the world found they not only reduced, had meaningful reductions in crime uh, and various types of crime, but they didn't lead necessarily to crime displacement, the so-called balloon effect. But the key here is that restoring trust, especially in this era of polarization between police and communities is absolutely essential, which is why focused deterrence and violence disruption programs tend to show some promise. And one of the final takeaways, and I'll end here, is that by focusing on areas of concentrated disadvantage, where there's high levels of economic deprivation and residential instability, we can actually see some results. So programs that improve the integrity of public space, that contribute to affordable housing, and strategies that include younger people and keep them in school and in work, uh, as well as offer language training, uh, are key. And CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is often singled out as a, a very specific strategy that seems to have some promise. So addressing these issues of prevention, of family disruption, and providing support, especially single-headed female households and male households, is, is critical. So let me end there, and, and looking forward to a really fruitful conversation today.